We're going to be in, as I said, in John chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 6, and uh, I'll read uh, verse 6 through 9, and we'll uh, pray and get started. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Dear Lord, I just pray that you would uh, just do a work here in this service, Lord, that you would just uh, allow your spirit to uh, affect us, Lord, and that we wouldn't be thinking about the cares of this world, that we wouldn't be concerned about uh, the different things that are going on and and uh, the troubles and cares that we have, but we would put those burdens on you and just focus on your word for this time. Lord, please help us to understand your word and to live your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, here uh, you have, in the, these verses, it's, it's speaking of John coming to, to bear witness for Jesus. Uh, there's a lot of prophecies in the Bible about the coming of the Lord. Uh, there's over 300 prophecies that the birth and, uh, birth to resurrection of Jesus Christ fulfilled in your Bible, in the Old Testament. You know, uh, the, the fulfilling of the last prophet's, this is part of the fulfilling of the last prophet's prophecy in Malachi 3.1. Uh, that's one of the places I'm going to actually turn to. Uh, or the, for those of you that don't know who Malachi is, Malachi, the Italian prophet, and uh, there in 3.1. It says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. So, in order for Jesus to come, the messenger had to come before him. Uh, you know, uh, Jesus Christ is that light, but for them to be aware of who the light was, the messenger had to come. You know, so often, uh, I think in modern day Christianity, we overlook the importance of John the Baptist, which, which, is, which is tragic because even Jesus himself called him the greatest prophet. So if he's the greatest prophet, why do we never really think about him or, or hear about him? It, the things he did in the in the short period of time he's in the Bible are are key to our understanding. He was sent as a witness of the light. There in verse seven and eight it says, "The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. You see, he was not the light, but he had, he had to bear witness of it. Uh, if we look at Acts chapter nineteen. Evening services, I usually let you flip back and forth a little bit more. Usually the people that stick around can get there on time. Uh, 19, verses 4 and 5 says, Then said Paul, John, verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they had heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. See, here he's correcting, he say, these were people he was speaking to that had the baptism of John, they were following John, and he said, yes, John prepared the way, but you need to accept Jesus. You can't just accept that he taught great things, you have to accept Jesus. He wasn't taking away from the teaching of John the Baptist, he was, he was glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, in John chapter 3, where we were uh, this morning, in chapter... 3, but in verse 26 through 30, it says, And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond the Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am set before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoice greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my, this my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. 
He must increase, but I must decrease. You see, John knew his place. He knew that he was to deliver this great word of the coming Savior, but that he, the time would come when he had to decrease so that the Lord could increase. You know, the, the prophets of, of old told of the prophecy of the coming light. In Isaiah 42, 6, it says, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thine hand, and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. So they even knew that light was supposed to go to the Gentiles. You know, there, there was much of the word of God that these, some, that these people, especially, actually, those that came against Christ, knew. And that was part of the problem. They didn't want to give up their position. You know, they knew that the light was coming. They knew what John the Baptist was saying was true. They knew that Jesus was the light and is the light. Uh, in verse 9, back in chapter 1, it says, That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. If you look at John 8, 12, John 8, 12, it also says, Then spake Jesus, gave Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. You know, Jesus declared that he was this light that was spoken of in prophecy. You know, uh, I, I've heard it said many times, and that doesn't make it uh, any less true. Jesus Christ is either the Son of God and our Savior, or he's the biggest liar that's ever been on the planet. He can't just be a good man. Because if he was a good man, everything he, everything he said was a lie. good man wouldn't lie to you. And, and so often in our society, they say, yeah, Jesus was good. His teachings were good. It's great to follow those teachings. But he was just a man. No, he was the light. He was the Son of God. Uh, John chapter 12, verse 46, it says, I, I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, it says, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine onto them. You see, you can't get saved without the light. Uh, another uh, way I've heard this put is, uh, you, you have two different types of people in this world. You have those that are seeking the light and those that are fleeing the light. And what you can liken this to, right, to say a, to tell a parable, this isn't a parable, this is in the Bible, but a parable is a way of likening something to something else. You have, if you have a child who's lost in the, in the woods and it's getting dark and they see flashlights coming through the woods, that child who's seeking the light, who's trying to find a way out of a dark place, is going to run to those flashlights. But if in those same woods you have an inmate that escaped prison and is happy living in his sin and doesn't want to go back to prison and doesn't want to repent of what he's done wrong and he sees those lights coming through the woods, he's going to flee from that light. He's going to want to abide in darkness. You see, that's what, that's what the scripture's telling us is that the light is there for us to, to bring us out of the darkness. But we have to accept that light. Exodus gives a foreshadowing. In Exodus chapter 13, verse 21, it says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. You see, I love uh, just going and, and, and searching and, and spending time in the Old Testament because as I shared many times before, I grew up in a church that wasn't real sound, and I didn't understand that all this was in my Old Testament. I didn't know that Jesus Christ was right there at all, all through the Old Testament, just examples of, of their coming Savior and examples of what they had to look forward to. You know, uh, and, and I know often they couldn't necessarily understand it all, but they knew that God promised them a Savior. They knew that God wasn't going to let them stay in the condition they were in. You know, uh, <clears throat> the other important thing that we have to understand here is as it goes on and in uh, verse number 10, it says, He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Jesus Christ was the creator. You know, uh, he was fulfilling prophecy. You know, and in verse 14, it also says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and beheld his, 
his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So here you have the Creator coming to earth. To me, and I, I, I probably end up talking about it more than most because I just find it so wonderful. Like, you know, we just sang a bunch of songs about it. You know, it, it's like to me, why can't you sing those, some of those songs all year? I mean, not all of the same ones at every service, but every service you could sing one of them. You know, why can't, why can't we sing about our Creator coming to save us? You know, I mean, you know, I mean, some of them we wear out in the Christmas season. But, you know, there, but, you know, you could, you could sing one every now and then just remind people that, you know, our Creator became flesh. The Word of God was made flesh to show us His, show us his light. You know, uh, Genesis uh, chapter 1 very much so parallels the beginning of John chapter 1. You know, talking about the creation, how it was spoke into, we were, the world was spoke into creation. The word of God, which is Jesus Christ, is the creator. In Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 12, it says, He hath made the earth by his power, he hath established the world by his wisdom, and has stretched out the heaven by his discretion. You know, God controls all these things. So often we forget that Christ went to the cross. I was just reading earlier today and later part of John, you know, Christ even told his disciples, they couldn't, they, I could not be killed except for I allow myself to die. I go to the cross. I choose that. Jesus chose to die for us. I, I think so many people picture it as somebody made him get on that cross. Jesus at any time could have refused the, to get on the cross. He's, he, he's God. He wouldn't have because it would violate his own world, word. But, but he chose the cross. And, you know, and... You know, he, he chose the whole path that he had to take. He chose every bit of suffering. He chose every bit of, of, uh, of betrayal. You know, he knew who Judas was. You know, here you have the, the creator living with these people, and one of them actually thinks that Jesus doesn't know who he is. You know, when, when, I, when I look at, the, at Judas, it just makes you wonder, like, You've seen this man do all these things. How could you possibly not get it? How could you not know? But he was blinded by the things of this world, right? When, when he corrected Mary for putting the ointment on Jesus' feet, he just wanted the money. You know, I mean, I know no one in this church ever does it, but, I mean, I've been in churches where there was certain members of the church that they were against anything that church ever wanted to do because, well, what about the money? Okay, yeah, it takes money. Got it. The money's God's. He'll take care of it. We just need to we just need to be faithful and keep moving forward. You know, he's he's Jesus Christ was the creator and came to to give us the light and to save us. In Psalms chapter thirty three, verse six it says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. In John 1.1, 1, 1, as I mentioned earlier, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's just so amazing how his plan always works out. You know, uh, here in verse 11 through 13, it says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. You know, uh, God knew he was going to be, re Jesus knew he was going to be rejected. I mean, otherwise the Old Testament wouldn't have mentioned him going to the Gentiles. His word getting to the Gentiles. He knew. You know, he knew his people were going to reject him. In uh, verse 12, it goes on and says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. 13 says, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. See, there's two kinds of people this produces in the world. The Jewish people did not accept as a whole, so it was given to all men to be able to accept him and become his children and see the light as is foretold. You know, even Jesus 
warned his disciples his power is a power of division. You see, you're always going to have those that accept the light and those that don't. It's going to cause division. I don't know of a, a family, and maybe you're from one that, that, is, uh, that is this blessed, and if you are, hey, tell me afterwards. But I don't know of a family that, all, that is 100% everyone in that family is saved. Oh, yours? Okay. So, that, so there's one. That's a, I mean, you know, because, I mean, my family, seven kids, there's three that I know for sure. You know, as, as sure as you can know about another man's salvation. There's one other that might be. You know, uh, I know of many other families. A good uh, a son of mine that's out in Nevada, I call him son even though he's not my son by blood. He's a soldier that was in the Army that was there at Black River. He's back out in Nevada now. You know, he's the only one saved in his entire family. There's members of his family that don't like it when he brings up Jesus. It's going to cause division. You know, the, the light divides. Uh, if you could look at Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, verse 49 is where I'm going to start. And it says, I am come to send fire on earth, and what will I, and, and what will I if it be already kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straightened till it be accomplished? Suppose ye that I come to give peace on earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. For from henceforth there shall be five in one house, divided three against two, and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son, and the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, and the daughter against the mother. The mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And he said also to the people, when you see a cloud rise out of the west, straight away you say, there come a shower, and so it is. And when you see the south winds blow, you say, there will be heat, and it cometh to pass. Ye hypocrites, you have discerned the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this time? Yea, and why even of yourselves judge ye not what is right? When thou goest with thine adversary to the magistrate, as thou art in the way, Give diligence that thou mayest be delivered from him, lest he hell thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and the officer cast thee into prison. I tell, tell thee, thou shalt not depart thence till thou hast paid the very last might. You see here in Luke, he's talking about how the power of God is separation, and how, you know, he, how there's, there's going to be these conflicts, and how we can't be blind to this. We can discern all these things around us, but yet when, when people refuse Christ or when family members come against us, we can't understand it. We understand everything else but that. We, can't discern, we can discern all these things of the world, but we can't understand the spiritual things. God has always kept separation. In Ezra chapter 10, verse 11, it says, Now therefore make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers, and do his pleasure, and separate yourselves from the people of the land and from strange wives. In Deuteronomy 11, chapter 11, verse 29, it says, And it shall come to pass, when the Lord thy God hath brought thee into the land, whether thou goest to possess it, that thou shalt put the blessings upon the Mount Gerizim, and the curse upon a Mount Abel. So here he was saying, there'll be a blessing for these people, and there'll be a curse for these people. God has always had separation. We have to remember that there's, exposed, there's, a, there's a healthy separation in the Lord. In Deuteronomy 27, 11 through 13, it says, And Moses charged the people the same day, saying, These shall stand upon Mount Gerizim to bless the people when you are come over Jordan, Simon and Levi and Judah and Issachar and Joseph and Benjamin. And these shall stand upon Mount Ebal to curse Reuben, Gad and Asher and Zebulun, Dan and Naphtali. See, there's going to be a blessing and a cursing. We can't avoid it. Some people are not going to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And you, you can't convince them by making it sound better in a worldly way. You know, uh, if, you, if there's one thing you could bring away from today, you know, about the Lord being the light, is that he's the only way. Without him lighting your path, you can't get there. 
We have to move away from these, these, uh, these false doctrines that say, oh, there's many ways to heaven. Or, you know, God called us to talk about sin. No, God wants you to talk about sin. God hates sin. That's all there is to it. But yet we're, we're afraid to mention that, that things are sinful. God hates it when people steal. God hates it when people uh, do, do, on, uh, do ungodly sexual acts. God hates it when people commit murder. God hates, you know, all drunkenness. God hates people being vile. He still, he still loves the people. Jesus Christ said himself that he did not wish for anyone to perish. But some of us are going to choose not to follow that light. Some of us are going to be that, so, some, of, some of the people that you have met in your life are going to just shut the door. I haven't really talked to your pastor much about how you guys go about your uh, witnessing to, to your surrounding area. I know this is more rural, so it's less common to door knock in rural areas because you've got to drive miles to knock on a door. And, uh, but, you know, there's been lots of times when I've been out door knocking where a door's just been slammed in my face. I still pray for that person, and I want somebody else to witness to them. But that may be the last time that person ever gets a chance to slam the door in the face. Some people just choose the darkness. But we have to do our best to make sure that they understand that they're choosing. They're choosing darkness over light. They're choosing the path that's going to lead to hell. And that's what John the Baptist was, was warning the people of. He was telling them to repent, turn away from your sins, turn away from the darkness, and prepare yourself for the Savior. That was the importance of John the Baptist, to get back to our main point, of why he's a pivotal, uh, he's a pivotal prophet. You know, he's he's the, the, the greatest prophet according to our Savior. And that's because he was the one that was sent to prepare the way. You know, uh, isn't it great how in uh, God's eyes, a prophet that didn't get a book is the greatest prophet. I think sometimes we get too caught up in who's getting the credit. John didn't do that. John said, glory be to God. I need to decrease so that he can increase. So often in our lives, we're worried about, well, I can't stay, you know. I've, I've seen a guy that several times tried to take a church. Because he didn't want to stay an assistant pastor. I really think it was just, he didn't like that title of assistant. Who cares? God doesn't see you as an assistant. God doesn't see me as any differently than he sees any of you. He's, he's only judging what we do for him in his spirit. If you're doing it for, no matter what you're doing. If I'm standing up here right now because I want, because I'm sitting here saying, well, man, they're going to think I'm such a great guy, you know. They're, they're, they're going to think I'm wonderful. If I'm standing up here for that reason, there's no blessing in it for me. You know, I, I seriously, honestly believe some of the people that when we get to heaven, we're going to see that have the most rewards are going to be just prayer warriors that never got an ounce of credit in their churches, but they prayed constantly. You know, because you got, you got a lot of quiet people in your churches that just sit back and listen. They love the Lord. And if you talk to them, you can tell they love the Lord, but they're not that active about maybe certain things. You know, they don't want to preach. They don't want to teach a Sunday school, but they're just praying. Hey, that, that, that's, a, that's a gift to any church. You know, that re, revivals and the Great Awakenings were started through prayer. I mean, there's a monument just outside of, outside of uh, Lowville to a man that was a prayer warrior. You know, he helped the revivals through prayer. But so often we get caught up in credit. Following the light isn't about credit. The only one that should be getting any credit or any glory is Jesus Christ. You know, I can't stand, you know, when people use too much of a possessive tone towards the things of the Lord. You know, I say it's my church because I attend it, not because it's my church. But I know everyone's heard people that say, Mine in a way like they forgot that it belongs to God. And we have, to, we have to stay away from that. It's all God's. Move towards the light. Live in the light. Follow God. 
Don't let yourself be led astray and go back into the, those paths of darkness. You know, and then we have to be a reflection of that light. Jesus Christ came to be a light so that we could reflect him. You know, uh, his sacrifice was for us to get saved and reflect him. There where he says, uh, but as many receive him, gave him power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Those that believe on his name, that's talking about us. It's talking about those that never seen him. We believe on his name, even. So, so even us, even those of us that never seen Jesus Christ, even us that are not apostles or disciples of Jesus Christ in the way that we serve there with him, we have that power as the sons of God to bring about the things of God. We just have to live in it. I'm going to go ahead and close in prayer, and uh, I'll spend some time in prayer for the, the people here and, and that have heard the message. And if the Lord's tugged on your heart about anything, you need to get right to get back with the light. Or if you haven't, if you haven't yet accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, Feel free to pray where you're at or come forward to the altar and pray. If you come up here and pray, I'll, I'll, I will check on you and may, see if you, you need me to pray with you on anything. But whatever you feel comfortable with, it's not about my comfort. It's about you accepting what Jesus would have you do. So if Jesus is telling you to come to the altar, come to the altar. If he's telling you to pray in your seat, pray in your seat. I'm not here to decide what the Lord tells you. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this service. Lord, I just ask that you would help us all to follow the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you for the gift of your Son. I thank you for John the Baptist coming to prepare the way. Lord, let us all understand that for you to increase, we must decrease. We must follow after the, the method of John. Lord, I just ask that you would just continue to speak to our hearts. And as this song plays, that we would all spend time in, in prayer and just uh, spend time in with you, Lord, and asking you to, to guide us and direct us. Lord, I know that there's someone here that hasn't accepted you yet. Lord, I know that there's uh, many children here. Maybe some of them are not quite of the age where they are fully understanding. I pray that this message will plant seeds so that as they get older, they will come to an accepting knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I, I ask that you would just help us to understand how special it is that our Creator came to earth and sacrificed Himself for our sins, Lord. Each of our sins, individually. He died for everyone in this room. He gave willingly of His own life on the cross so that we could be saved. Lord, I also pray that you will help us to understand that sometimes this belief is going to cause division because your son said that it would cause division, Lord. And if the Bible says it, we know it's true, that there will be those that don't want to accept, that there will be those that stand against us, Lord. Please help us to be strengthened in our faith. Please help us to understand that this world is divided in two, two kinds of people, those that choose to accept the Lord Jesus Christ and those who don't. Lord, most of all, I make one last plea to you that if there's someone here today who has not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would speak to their heart at this moment and they would get saved, Lord, that they would just surrender to you Lord, please protect us as we go about our days this week. Please help us to continue to stay following your light. Help us to not flee into the darkness once we leave this building, but to live as examples for those around us. Please guide us and direct us throughout this week and throughout the rest of our days until you come back or 
where we breathe our last breath, Lord, and we're, and we're with you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.